Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, start up again. I know it's Friday night. Usually Friday night, 8.15, my wife and I are climbing into bed with a book and we're asleep in 10 minutes. So <laughs> you're probably thinking, oh, that's where I'd like to be right now. And uh, I'm thankful that it's not going to be in the 70s and sunny this weekend, but it will be in the 60s and sunnies. So I do appreciate your attendance. Well, at least here tonight. Who knows if you'll be back tomorrow. Just to give a couple of recommendations on books. If you're looking for the most basic, get me started on engaging other people. This book called Tactics is fantastic. We use it as a textbook in the college, but it's a really easy read. Just walks you through how to have effective uh, conversations. One of the biggest apologetic issues that's come up in recent years that didn't used to be an apologetic issue is the issue of homosexuality because many times it's a gateway in conversation. If you answer the question wrong, that's the end of the conversation. And one of the most powerful tools out there today is a little book called Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. It's written by a lady named Rosaria Butterfield who is a tenured professor of English at Syracuse University, lesbian feminist. And uh, long story short, a pastor in town started writing to her, inviting her to come to dinner with him and his wife because she was an activist writing letters that, or articles in the local newspaper. She thought it'd be good research, so she went to their house and for a year kept going back for dinner and finally became a Christian. And she writes in here, she's now a pastor's wife years later, she writes in here about what it took for her to, to untangle um, her opposition to God to become a Christian and then the years after that to untangle her identity as a as a feminist and a lesbian to see herself primarily as a Christian and then let God transform her thinking. Uh, she is in demand all over the country because she's brilliant, very articulate, lives in Northern Virginia, so probably not far from here, um, and uh, has written several good books on sexuality and gender that really help Christians engage thoughtfully and effectively with unbelievers on this issue. And then a third, third book, there are several books by Nabil Qureshi, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Nabil Qureshi was a um, devout Pakistani Muslim med student and happened to be rooming with a Christian guy. Uh, and over the course of the first two or three years of his med school, he became a Christian. And uh, for a number of years, probably for the last 10 years or so, has been the, the most effective apologist to Muslims this book uh, recounts his salvation, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And sadly, about a year or two ago, Nabil died of stomach cancer in his early 30s. Um, wrote about four books, was a widely popular apologist because he truly understood uh, Islam and very effective book here if you engage uh, Muslim coworkers or neighbors. Uh, so those are three helpful books. I can recommend all the books on the table. I've read most of them or parts of all of them. And if you ask me questions, I'd be happy to share more details. All right, this session now is called Understanding Unbelievers. And for me, as I began to learn apologetics, this was the most influential thing for me to learn. So if you take your Bibles and turn to Romans 1, in Romans 1, God gives us an insight into what's going on in the heart and mind of every unbeliever. And as I sat in class probably 12 years or so ago, and the professors are lecturing on Romans 1, all these light bulbs are going off in my head like, oh, that changes everything. Oh, I always wondered about that. Oh, I never knew that. So I hope you have moments of epiphany as much as I did at the time. So Romans 1 talks about what, what every person who is born into this world knows about God. Romans 1, verse 18. It says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived. God's invisible nature is clearly perceived by every unbeliever ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images 
resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So I want you to notice, let's work through this passage. Notice, first of all, this passage says that every unbeliever already knows God exists and knows some things about him. They're like, Mark, have you ever met an atheist? Yeah, I've met lots of them. In fact, God seems to always send atheists my way. I don't know why, but I meet them everywhere. And I actually enjoy, I love talking to atheists. I think because fundamentally their worldview is very easy to dismantle. Um, but I, I encounter a lot of them from educated atheists to the, what we call village atheists, people who make it their life's goal to destroy God and everything in it, even though they've never studied philosophy or science or anything like that, um, to teenagers struggling with belief in God, uh, all different types of atheists. And Romans 1 says everyone born into this world because they're made in the image of God knows God. Like, how, how can they know God? Because the Bible contrasts two types of knowing of God. There's, there's, in a, there's a knowing of God, relationship of God in wrath, and a relationship of God in grace. So every person born into this world knows God, as this passage says. They know him as a God of wrath, because verse 18 says the wrath of God has been revealed. In other words, God shows unbelievers that he's angry at their sin, that they're guilty before him, which is why universally, every corner of the world, people develop religious rights, whether they're overtly religious or not, trying to atone for what they've done wrong. Every religion in the world has a system of atonement. Every unbelieving system of atheism, agnosticism, skepticism has a way to either atone for sin or to somehow pretend sin doesn't exist. So I recently, a few years ago, I became friends with the co-founder of the Pennsylvania Skeptics Conference that's organized every year. All the, all the atheists in Pennsylvania come together for a conference. And uh, he happens to live in my town, so we've become acquaintances or friends. And, um, you know, he, he denies that there's any wrong in the world. He doesn't believe in good and evil, doesn't believe right and wrong. Even when I say things like, so, you know, he has two small kids. He says, so if someone were to harm your kids, you wouldn't say that was wrong? Nope, I don't think there's right and wrong. But we've learned in society that those things don't make for, for a good society, so that's unproductive. And so, so you can't call it evil at all. No, there's no such thing as evil. I'm like, okay. And what he's doing, as we'll see in just a moment, is he's trying to be faithful to his system while being totally irrational. It's Ravi Zacharias, who's probably one of the most well-known apologists now, there's a story where one time he was uh, taking questions from the audience and the man was arguing that there was no good and evil, no right and wrong. And Robbie said, sir, are you saying if I brought a child up here on the platform and took out a sword and cut the child's head off that you wouldn't say that was wrong? And the man said, well, I wouldn't like it, but I couldn't say it was wrong. And Robbie said, the very fact that you had to preface your statement with I wouldn't like it shows that you know it's wrong. You're just trying to pretend like it is not. So this passage tells us that everyone already knows God exists. And what do they know? Well, first of all, we know that every person is made in the image of God. That is the very nature of, of being a human is you are made to reflect the one true God. So when people try to deny that God exists, they're trying to deny something that's so obvious. It's like, do you know anybody whose kids look just like the spitting image of them? And if they were to say, oh, no, that's not my dad, it would be laughable, right? Because they look like them, they sound like them, they act like them. That's exactly what an unbeliever does when he denies the truth about God. He's denying what cannot be denied on their, you know, in their very makeup, their face, their behavior. It's kind of like, you know, I was, could never figure out as a kid how my parents knew what I did wrong until I had kids of my own, right? And you're in the other room, suddenly your kids come in, hey, dad, what? Nothing. Uh, yeah, 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 no, what, what are you talking about? And, and you haven't said a word, right? And like, you're so guilty, kid. You know, sprinkles around your mouth and you didn't eat the donut, whatever it might be. The Bible says that's what's going on in the heart of every unbeliever. Secondly, every person has the implanted knowledge of God. That is part of being made in the image of God is that we know him because we're made to reflect him. And all through this passage, it says over and over again, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. He's revealed it to them. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Over and over again, God keeps saying, oh, oh, they know me. They know me. But they're trying to do away with me. They're trying to pretend like I don't exist. They don't want to respond. And think about, here's the reason why. 
Christianity is both the easiest religion or faith and the most difficult. We know it's the easiest because there's no effort on your part required. There's just repentance for my sin and trust in Jesus who paid for my sin. So simple. But it is also by far the most terrifying in its requirements because you as a guilty sinner deserving of God's wrath and eternal hell have to stand before a holy God and admit, I am guilty and I deserve your full wrath. That is terrifying, which is where all the other religions come from. Because if I can create a God that will accept sacrifices, if I can create a God that accepts, um, you know, walking uh, on my knees on broken glass, that's easier than standing before a holy God and admitting I'm guilty and I deserve his wrath. And we'll see in just a moment, that's part of the reason why people reject the truth. Thirdly, the holy nature of God in his wrath against sin is clear, plain, and well known by unbelievers. So when I'm talking to an unbeliever, as I get to know them, or if there's someone I've known for a while, I'm looking in their life for ways they're trying to make up for what they've done wrong. My wife works at the hospital in Lancaster, and uh, she's worked there almost five years, and God always puts these very antagonistic skeptics in her, working with her in her office. And they bombard her with questions, they criticize her, they make fun of her faith. But she says, Mark, Lent comes around and all these non-religious people are putting ashes on their forehead. Or they're raising money for this saint who's going to pray for them. And they don't believe any of it. But why are they doing that? Because they're terrified they might have missed something. Just like in Acts 17, Athens, the religious capital of the world, and there's an altar to an unknown God, just in case we missed one. And Paul says, I've come to tell you about this one that you've missed. Why? Because people have to make atonement for their sin. So why does a man who's a workaholic try to buy his children's love or his wife's love? Because he's trying to make atonement for the God that he's worshiping, success or money or advancement, and he figures he can make atonement by paying it off, by buying people. How does a mother whose God is control of all things in her kid's life and her family's life and she rules the rod of iron, how does she make atonement? She then spoils them because she knows that she's doing things she shouldn't. I mean, in every way in our lives, we try to make atonement if we're not being gospel-focused and saying, Lord, help me to repent of my sin and accept that you've forgiven me. Every person is wired to make atonement. Why? Because they know that they're guilty before God. This knowledge of God, then, we're told, at the end of verse 20, makes the unbeliever without excuse. After all these, these, these things, God says, because they have clearly perceived me, because they have known me, because I've shown them my nature, they are without excuse. So when I'm dealing with an unbeliever, I'm dealing, think about, think about the unbelievers you know in your life. Coworkers, friends, family, neighbors. Every one of them knows they're guilty before God. And every one of them in a different way is trying to either ignore that atone for it, come up with some way to um, live with it. And when you're talking with them, what you're doing is you're bringing up a topic that they do not want to talk about if they're, if they're antagonistic. Now, you might encounter someone who's like, oh, you know, I've been wondering this stuff all my life. In other words, there's a person who's starting to realize I cannot fight this any longer. But when you deal with someone who responds antagonistically, or doesn't, doesn't want to talk about it and doesn't show interest, it's because you're, you're trying to help them to see something they don't want to see. I was on a plane one time with a guy, and uh, I, I just sat down and started reading my Bible, and at some point he looked over and said, oh, what are you reading? I said, oh, the Bible. And because I didn't do what we're going to learn tomorrow morning is take the time to ask questions, find out where he was spiritually, so I just launched into the gospel burp. You know, for sure, if you die, take you to heaven, call God loves you, but if you want to sin, you know, and I was done, he was like, well, frankly, I think religion's a really personal thing, and I'd rather not talk about that. If you want to talk about sports, then I'd talk about sports, but I think religion's too, too personal. And if I'd been quick, I would have said, you know, sports is really too personal kind of thing. Um, you know, it's something that's kind of sacred to me, so I'd rather not talk about that. Let's talk about religion or whatever. In other words, <laughs> why did he dismiss me? He dismissed me because, and the more I got to know him on the flight, he was an up-and-coming, successful person. 
And there's no way he's going to let the God who intrudes on your life in every way into his scheme of worshiping the God of success. So number two then, we're told, oh, here's a good cartoon. Patient goes to the doctor and says, Doc, I have metal fillings in my mouth. My refrigerator magnets keep pulling me into the kitchen. That's why I can't lose weight. (laughs) Obviously not a good excuse. And yet when the unbeliever tries to claim that God is not there or does not believe in them, they're doing the same type of thing. Number two, we're told in this passage, every unbeliever suppresses the knowledge of God in an attempt to escape the accountability. There's a key word in verse 18. It says, by their unrighteousness, unbelievers suppress the truth. What does suppress mean? Suppress means to push down or hold back that which is trying to rise to the surface. Push down or hold back. In other words, Mark, how can you say that everyone knows God? I know people that say they don't believe in God. I know people that just don't want to talk about it because as God says here, everyone every day is pushing down this knowledge of God, which rises up every day because we're told that these things have been revealed in the things that have been made, creation, the way people relate, the way they're made. Everything about creation shouts the glory of God. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Everything in this world points toward the truth of the existence of the living God. And so every day, the unbeliever's got to push it down. It's kind of like holding a beach ball underwater, right? You push it under, what's going to happen? Every time it's going to come up. When I was a kid, we used to love to just, you know, push the ball underwater, watch it pop back up, push it back under. So every day, the unbelievers in your life, in different ways, are trying to push down this knowledge of God, that they're guilty, that they deserve his wrath, and they're trying to push it down, and they they do that a number of different ways. And when you come along and you witness to them, you begin to talk to them about their soul, talk to them about Jesus, ask them what's going on in their life, tell them you're going to pray for them, give them a gospel track, you're holding their hands back so that knowledge rises up in them. And some people break down and cry. I can't talk about this. Some people get angry. I was doing a conference one time and a guy said, what should I do every time I try to share the gospel with my brother? He beats me up. I said, really? He's like, no, I'm telling you, physically, he assaults me. He came at me with a chair a couple of months ago. I'm like, well, you should protect yourself. <laughs> but why would his brother do that kind of thing? Because he's holding back his hand to the knowledge of God. His guilt is rising up and he reacts violently, as some people might do. It's kind of like when you know you've caught a virus and you're going through your day, you feel good, and all of a sudden your stomach goes, brrr. You're like, ooh, that did not feel good. But, okay, it went away. A little while later, a wave of nausea comes over you and your stomach goes, brrr, and you're like, oh, no. No, 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 I'm not going there. I'm not going to that porcelain throne. I'm not going to spend the next 12 hours. And what happens as time goes on, the wave starts coming more frequently, you know, I, I, I hate getting sick this way. Just, it's the worst thing in the world. It's the only time in my life I ever want to die is, is because of nausea. And what happens, most of the time, eventually, you cannot suppress it. It comes out. And so people every day are suppressing this knowledge of God, trying to hold back that which we cannot hold back. And how they do that, they do it a thousand different ways. Some people suppress the truth of God by turning to other religions. So you can jot down just one word, religion. Why, why do people go to other religions rather than the truth of the gospel, which salvation is a free gift? It's because in the other religions, you can earn your way in some way. Every other religion in the world says you can do something to advance yourself toward um, heaven, nirvana, paradise. When I lived in the Philadelphia area, we had an outreach to the mosque in our town. And the guy who led it was a an Egyptian-born Christian. So he spoke Arab fluently, which most Muslims don't. Um, Knew the culture. And so even to this day, he has outreaches in nine or ten different mosques around Philadelphia. And he started this strategy called Meetings for Better Understanding, where he would go into a mosque, say, hey, why why don't you Muslims and us Christians get together? Let's share our faith for better understanding. And they love it. And uh, so every three months, we'd pick a topic, and sometimes we meet in Christian churches, sometimes in the mosque, and we would discuss what is God's word or 
Um, what does our religion say about what happens when we die? Different topic every time. And we would spend two, three hours in the mosque and talk about these things, share a meal. It was incredible the doors that opened. But one time we were talking to an imam who was like the pastor or theologian, and I was asking him, do you know for sure during this lifetime if you're going to paradise? And he said, no, we can never know. And he gave me this illustration. He said, every day, every Muslim is climbing a rope to God, and, or to Allah. And Allah is holding the rope over hell. And at any moment, he can let the rope go and you fall into hell. He said, a, a person could be a good Muslim all their life, make one mistake, and Allah can send them to hell. They can be a bad Muslim all their life, do one good thing, Allah can take them to heaven. I thought, how do you live day by day with that idea? Even when you're the most faithful Muslim, you hang in the balance every day. And yet, what's the appeal to that? I can do something about being made right with the God or the divine. So some people, rather than facing a holy God with their guilt, says, I'll, I'll do this because I can do something about it. Some people turn, or some people, second point, distractions. Some people fill their lives with distractions. Why, why in our society, I'm getting ready to do a lecture on technology in a couple months, why have, in such a sweeping way, all of human history up to the last 10, 15 years, have we suddenly changed our behaviors worldwide, where now we have a device. I just read our article the other day how an iPhone is, is designed to be caressed, to be held. You know, you move your thumb across at your fingers. In other words, it becomes this intimate object. It's designed like that on purpose. And you know this, and, and I have no problem with technology. I, I do live in Amish country, but I'm not against technology. I could, listen, I could tell you stories about the Amish that would just shock you because I live all around them, or they live all around me. But why, why do normal thinking people sit in groups together where they used to talk or play games or things like that? Why are they all, you know, like this? We see this at the college all the time. You see this anywhere you go. People used to talk in public, and now everyone's in their own world. And you know what? There's infinite distraction here, isn't there? I mean, I'm thankful for some of it because it makes my life easier, but this is a dangerous tool because it can distract me from facing up to my real problems, my real relational issues, my guilt before God, and I don't have to think about it if I have a thousand games to play or I can scroll through Facebook indefinitely uh, or watch videos, whatever it might be, all good things in themselves, but people suppress by distraction. And then thirdly, they, they suppress through dulling the pain. Why do people become drug addicts? Why do they become alcoholics? Food, I mean, you can kill yourself with drugs, alcohol, food, sex, television, entertainment, um, adrenaline. Uh, we can go right down the line. Why do people do that? Because they know they're guilty. They know they, they've sinned. They know they've hurt other people. They know they've ruined relationships, and they don't want to face up to it too much. When I was a pastor, I, had a, um, I, did a, I used to do funerals for people that had no religious affiliation. And because people were grieving, just stand up there and preach the gospel. Oh, that was an amazing message. I didn't hear a word I said. But they, they didn't object to the gospel either. I remember talking to a police officer at a, at a funeral. One of his friends took his life. And um, he said, i got to talk to you. I said, all right, I'll meet you at the reception. By the time I got the reception, he was stone cold drunk. Tried to share the gospel with him. He just wasn't understanding. I said, you know, I'm going to follow up with you tomorrow. I'll call back the next day. No interest. Why do people do that? Why do people, Pennsylvania, probably like down here, the opioid crisis is just unbelievable. It's killing people, you know, by the dozens and daily or weekly. Why do people do that? Because they're trying to dull the pain of guilt before God, because they're trying to deal with the sin that's been committed against them or the sin that they've committed against someone else. Notice in this passage, we're told that um, they suppress the truth, and suppression leads to several things. Suppression, first of all, leads to self-deception. This is a picture of me looking in the mirror, you know? I look in the mirror, I still think I'm 18, and well, actually, at 18, I was really skinny. I was 75 pounds lighter than I am now, same height. Um, but, you know, it's easy to fool yourself, isn't it? Yeah, I'm looking pretty good. I haven't changed a bit since I was 18. <laughs> it's 
totally fooling myself. Um, but people will deceive themselves if they suppress the truth long enough. They will convince themselves that they're good people. They'll convince themselves that they've never harmed anyone. They, they'll convince themselves that they're okay. Me and the man upstairs, we got an agreement. We're just fine. Thank you for talking to me about my soul, but I'm really okay. And if you suppress the truth long enough, you deceive yourself. George Orwell, the author of 1984, said, we are all capable of believing things which we know to be untrue. And then when we are finally proved wrong, impudently twisting the facts so as to show that we were right. Intellectually, it's possible to carry on this process for an indefinite time. The only check on it is that sooner or later, a false belief bumps up against solid reality, usually on a battlefield. In other words, you can no longer fool yourself when you are facing an enemy. The second uh, effect of suppressing the truth is you lead to irrationality. You start to believe things that are simply ridiculous to believe. And here's some good examples. Thomas Nagel, well-known professor of law and philosophy at New York University. Atheist, this is what he says about his atheism. I speak from experience, being strongly subject to this fear myself. I want atheism to be true. And I'm made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent, well-informed people I know are religious believers. It's not just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. There's a scientist, a philosopher who's saying, I'm not an atheist because I'm convinced. I just, I don't want the world to be that way. That's suppression of the truth. Uh, a couple months ago, I was doing a conference, uh, and a guy came up to me as a scientist. He said, Mark, i got to show you this passage in this science book. He said, this textbook on biochemistry is used in every university in America, written by Albert Leninger, John Hopkins. He said, I want you to look at the last page of the book. So I don't know anything. I'm terrible as far as science goes. I know water's H2O. That's about it. He said, the back of this very complex biochemistry textbook, Albert Leninger says, there's yet no satisfactory model or theory for the origin of the genetic code. Where did all this come from? Crick and Orgel have pointed out that it's not beyond reasonable possibility that genes in the genetic code may have been brought to Earth by, anybody want to guess? Spaceship, aliens. How does a brilliant man who writes a biochemistry textbook believe that? It's because he's suppressing the truth and he can become very irrational. Of course, he says, this idea is no answer to the problem since one must then explain how life arose elsewhere. Yes, obviously. Thirdly, suppression leads to idolatry. That is, if I suppress the truth of God long enough and deceive myself, I will set something else up as God and worship it. We see this all through this passage in Romans. Notice Romans 1.23. They exchange the glory of the mortal God for images. And what are these images? It starts dignified, resembling mortal man. And then it goes downhill to birds. At least, you know, birds have a God-eye view, which in the ancient world was something they couldn't conceive of. But that's one step down from man to animals or beasts. And you suppress the truth long enough, what are you worshiping? Creeping things. In other words, you lose your humanity. The further you suppress the truth, the more inhumane you become, and the more degraded you become. I think of some of the most extreme examples in our society of people degrading themselves. I, I, I teach ethics at the college, and we, we look at examples of people that want to be animals. So they have body modification to become like a lizard or like a cat or like... like what is wrong with those people? They're simply suppressing the truth more than other types of people. Uh, David Foster Wallace was a well-known novelist, young American novelist. They said this guy will be the, great, the next great American novelist. And a few years ago at Kenyon College, he gave a commencement address. You can look it up and see the whole thing on YouTube. And he's an atheist. When he says this, he says there's actually no such thing as atheism, even though he claimed to be an atheist. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Here's an atheist admitting you can't not worship. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. If you worship money and things, if there were you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. 
And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power, you'll end up feeling weak and afraid, and you'll need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect being seen as smart, and you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. Profound statement from a guy who claimed to be an atheist. The sad thing is, a few years after he gave this address, he took his life because he could not find the truth. And at the end of this quote, at the end of this address, he said, you know, the strange thing is, we already know these things. Romans 1. So every unbeliever you meet, when you're engaging them in conversation, you are telling them about something they already know and are trying to hold back. And here's another encouraging thing about this. We tend to think, okay, I'm trying to talk to this person. It's me and him. It's this battle of the wits and intellect, and I've got to somehow prove God exists and all this impossible stuff. Actually, what's going on is you're entering a dialogue that's already going on between the truth of God and them every day of their lives. God's revealing the truth. God's convicting them of sin. God's showing them they're guilty. You enter the conversation that's already going on. To me, that was like, oh, that makes it so much easier. I don't have to prove things that they already know to be true, that they're suppressing. A good example is when someone says, prove God exists to me. Can I tell you, that's impossible. The truth is you can't prove anything if you mean by proof, show me something that will automatically convince me. There's no such thing in the universe. You could have the best scientists in the world say, look, water is H2O, and someone says, I don't, I don't believe it, I'm sorry. So there's no such thing as give me some piece of evidence that will make me believe. So when people say, prove God exists to me, I come back with, what would it take to prove God exists to you? In other words, they put the ball in my court, I put it right back in their court. We'll learn about this tomorrow morning. And most of the time, what will they say, you think? Prove God exists, what would it take to prove for most skeptics? I want God to appear before me, right? I want to see him. Oh, okay. Now, what would God look like and what would he say to you that would automatically convince you that he exists? Sometimes people say, that's a good question. I really don't know what I would expect. So you want me to prove God exists, but you have no idea what it would look like. So maybe God has already done it and you're, not, you're unaware because you don't know what you're expecting. Usually they said something like, I'd want him to appear before me, not at night because I would think that was a dream, not in bright sunlight because I might think I'm hallucinating, but in some way I'd want him to appear before me and say something to me that, I know he was God. My response is, I'm so glad that you said that. Can I show you in the Gospels where God came down, not just to one person, not just for a few minutes, but for more than 33 years he lived on this earth. He was seen by thousands and tens of thousands. His miracles were done in the plain sight of everyone, and the grand finale was the resurrection. Can I show you that in the scripture? (laughs) We've moved right from an impossible thing, prove God exists, right down to would you look at this gospel passage with me? And what will happen then is if they're honest, they'll say, yeah, I'd like to see that. If they're dishonest, they'll say, oh, no, no, but see, that doesn't prove anything. It's like, okay, you're, you're you're really not asking me to prove God exists to you. You're just trying to give a, an objection that will make me go away. And you're not an, you're not an honest intellectual seeker. Let's move on then. Idolatry, then, is maintained by a series of exchanges. In this passage, three times we're told unbelievers exchange one thing for the other. Verse 23, they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images. So they take the truth of God, the glory of God, and they say, we don't want that. We will make images. And as you know, in the Old Testament, that was Israel's besetting problem. God says, worship me, follow me, I'll take care of you. I'll protect you, but no images of me. And Israel, just like us, says, ah, that's too hard. I need something to see. (laughs) Uh, About 12 years ago, I went to China, and the seminary where I was teaching was trying to make inroads into helping the underground church in China to gain training because most Chinese Christians and churches have no formal training because under communism, they haven't been allowed. So I was over there. It was really weird because I was supposed to go incognito So an almost seven foot tall white man in China, yeah. In fact, I knew it wasn't just my height because one day I was sitting in a taxi in the city and a bus pulled up next to me and and someone on the bus kind of looked down and did a double take 
because they saw there was me, a Westerner, a white person, they called everyone on the bus. Look, and everyone on the bus gathered around. Like, apparently there's not a lot of Westerners there. So I was there to teach secretly in the underground church. It was ludicrous. But while I was there, I bought a Rolex watch. It was be- it's, for some reason, Rolex is only $20 in China. I don't know why, but <laughs> it was beautiful. I was like, you know, caressing it all the way home on the plane. Like, oh, it's so gorgeous. And, you know, the next couple of weeks, I'm showing Everyone's like, wow, that's a gorgeous watch. It, it sparkled. It shone. And then the first time I spilled water on it, it, it steamed, the, the glass steamed up within about 20 minutes. The next morning, I, I woke up and one of the arms or one of the hands had fallen off and was floating in the water in the bottom of the, <laughs> the watch. Why? Because it wasn't real. It had a lot of appearances outwardly of being real, but it wasn't real. And what happens in an unbeliever's life is they don't want the truth of God, so they find a counterfeit. And so when I'm talking to an unbeliever, as we'll learn tomorrow morning, asking the right kind of questions, I'm asking questions to figure out what's their God? What do they live for? Where do they find their identity, their sense of belongingness and accomplishment? What, if it was taken away from them, would they feel like life wasn't worth living? That's their God, whatever it is. It could be success, money, family, all good things in themselves. In fact, most idols are good things taken out of context and made to be ultimate things. The second thing we're told is that the unbeliever exchanges the truth for a lie. In verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. That is, people don't want the truth, and so they'll settle for a lie. And then thirdly, the unbeliever exchanges the natural for the unnatural. In verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, I was taught growing up, this shows that homosexuality is the worst possible sin. It's not what it's saying. It's saying homosexuality is the most obvious case of trying to declare something natural that is clearly unnatural. In other words, God designed our bodies in such a way, complementarity between men and women, both physiologically, reproductively. And he points to this saying, people will take something that is so obviously not right, not true, or in this case, unnatural, and they will declare it to be natural, all in an attempt to suppress the truth of God. Which means that if I encounter someone who is gay, homosexual, um, I'm not going to fixate on their homosexuality, But I'm also not going to ignore it. Uh, In Lancaster, where I live, Amish country, we have a large, growing gay community. Uh, We have graduates of Lancaster Bible College. After they uh, graduate and leave, a couple years later, they come out as gay or lesbian. And uh, we have tried to reach out to them, to show love to them, speak the truth to them. I have an ongoing dialogue with one of our students who's now a lesbian living in Philadelphia with her partner. I have a good relationship with another a uh, graduate who uh, has come out as gay, and but we don't avoid the topic. I don't fixate on the topic. I show them love, give them a hug when I see them, tell them I care about them, tell them you can call at any time. But when they want to talk about real issues, we talk about the fact that, you know, our problem with God is sin. And part of what you love more than God is your sexuality, your gay lifestyle, just like other people love other things in their lives more than God. So we don't want to avoid the topic, but we also don't want to make it seem like it is the unforgivable sin or the worst sin of all. It's just clearly the most unnatural. And so unbelievers are exchanging the truth for a lie, glory for an image, natural for unnatural. And notice the top of the next page, the more an unbeliever exchanges the truth for a lie, the more God gives him over to further spiritual blindness. That is, think carefully with me, you'll meet some unbelievers who are not consciously rejecting God actively in their lives, and and you can talk to them about God, and they'll engage like, oh, I've never heard that before, it's very interesting, you know, I don't believe that, but that's neat. 
But the further a person consciously rejects the truth of God, the more God gives them over to spiritual blindness. And they're harder to reach because they're intentionally saying, no, I don't want to believe that. Now, that does not mean in any way that they're beyond the ability to be saved because the gospel, if the gospel can save the Apostle Paul, whose main goal in life was to kill as many Christians as he can and destroy the church, then God can save anyone you know, anyone I know. But sometimes when you encounter someone who's really hard, realize what they're doing is they're consciously rejecting the truth of God. It doesn't mean they're impossible. It means I have to be more strategic, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. But notice finally then, number three, the unbeliever's suppression of the truth is part of a complex system of belief called the worldview. A complex system of belief. That is, when I'm talking to an unbeliever, they have, whatever their worldview is, whatever their belief system is, it explains everything to them. Who they are, what this world is, what their purpose in life is, what the most valuable thing in life is, what determines right and wrong. So I need to help them untangle this complex approach to life because everyone forms a worldview. And what is a worldview then? A worldview is a commitment, an orientation of the heart that we hold, either consciously or subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently, about the basic constitution of reality. Everyone has this commitment of the heart that tells them who they are, why they're here, where they're going, what's wrong with the world, what makes life worth living. And tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about how do you untangle that? How do you share the gospel effectively in such a way that you begin to show them, hey, th this is wrong? And they go, oh, you know, you're right. That two-hour conversation I had the very first time, most of it was them saying, oh, I believe this, and me just asking a question. And then they'd go, Oh, you're right, I guess that contradicts what I said earlier. Uh, or, I, oh, yeah, I guess that doesn't make sense. And all I was doing is asking questions, and they were figuring out for themselves that what they believed did not make sense. And I'm sitting there saying, this is so powerful. Lord, keep, keep it coming, Lord. You know, give me things to say. Give me questions to ask. And little by little, they were coming to see for themselves that what they believed was a contradiction. And here they thought they were rational because they were an unbeliever, and I was irrational because I'm a Christian. And at the end of the hour, they begin to realize, I hold all these things that don't fit together, and yet your worldview makes sense because of who you think God is, who you think you are. And that has a powerful effect, as Paul will, as we'll look at tomorrow, to destroy the strongholds in people's lives. Those things that they build up, these, these monuments of unbelief that they find protection in, to smash those down leaves them open to the truth of the gospel. And God says, this is what's going on and the heart and life of every unbeliever you know every day of their lives. So when God brings you into their life and an opportunity to witness to them, oh man, a tempest is stirred up because you're challenging what they find their safety in. All right, let's take questions for about 15 minutes. Uh, questions on anything. Is it okay to step on this right here? Okay.